All right. Well, thanks for watching another virtual tasting with Benny's Beverage Depot. I'm Pat from the Whiskey Outline, along with Brett, as usual. Our special guests today are Carmen Villarreal, owner and CEO of Casa San Matias down in Mexico, and Megan Hurtuck, who handles all the marketing of agave spirits at the Sazerac Company, which is the importer of record, of course, tequila. So welcome. Thank you both for joining us tonight. We're excited to take a break from whiskey for once to talk about some agave spirits. Carmen, how's the weather down there in Mexico today? It's warm, sunny, beautiful weather. How uh, about that? It's humid and terrible and sunny. That's why I'm inside, but I'm not really built for outside in the sun. Megan feels me on that. So. <laughs> yeah. So Carmen, is the, or where does your rainy season fall? Are you at the end of that or are you about to get the rainy season no, in we Jalisco? Are, we are getting to the end of the rainy season. It's July and August. Okay. Start from June and maybe some uh, late rains in September as well. Mm -hmm. And that typically is for just for folks knowing a little bit about the agriculture of growing agave. That's typically the only time where you get any kind of appreciable precipitation, right? That's the one time when you get all the water for the ground. Yes, a lot of water, by the way, a lot of water in this area of Mexico, but just seasonal. And the agave is a wonderful plant that saves water through the year. Okay, and so how how long, so for those of you who don't know, how long, how, what generation are you? How many generations of your family have been owning and running Casa San Mateus? I, I am the fourth uh, CEO of the company. The company started in 1886. I have been running it for 50 years now. Okay. Wow. How many different point. brands are made at your distillery now? We have seven brands and we, we produce Corazon uh, in, in a partnership with Sazerac. Mm -hmm. We have been distilling it for almost 10 years now. And uh, as a sign of appreciation, we are enjoying our partnership that much that we decided to distill a tequila for them. Mm -hmm. Well, it's great tequila and it's one of the many now increasing amounts of 100% agave tequilas available on the market. And that's something we've seen obviously change greatly in tequila in my short time in the business is this transition from mixto style, uh, kind of those sub premium tequilas into these wonderful, flavorful 100% agave tequilas. And that's something that I think across the board, your portfolio has really kind of been leading the charge with on that. And so Corazon, you have your basic expressions, your Blanco, Reposado, and Añejo, of course. But you also started doing these single barrel expressions early. And was, was that a challenge uh, regulatory-wise, the government there? I know single barrel tequilas weren't exactly immediately embraced and immediately easy to do. It's a little bit challenging, but not much. We have um, a large aging room and a lot of experience in that. So our... Our quality manager is the master, um, our maestro tequilera is Rocio. It's the, the, the only uh, te maestro tequilera in, uh, female in, in Mexico. So oh, she's wow. wonderful in our team. So it's challenging, but we, we can do it and we are happy to do it. It's uh, having an, a different expression and offer something unique to the consumer. It's been very well appreciated and we are happy to to be able to do that. Female leadership isn't particular to you then at the distillery. Um, do you employ many females at the distillery top to bottom then? Is this a, it seems to be a very female focused company. Uh, we, we have, we are the only tequila distillery with a certification of the quality of gender. But, but that means that we offer the same opportunities for women than, than for men. And right now, I think we are a little bit over 50%, 54, I guess, percent of women working at San Matias and 46% uh, of men. So but you're, you're, mm -hmm. go ahead. No, I, I was just going to, to, to say that, of course, we, we support men too, the, the capabilities and the talent is, is so of course, something that we need. Yeah. It's just that we, we have been growing a lot in, in some specialties and, and brands 
and we have a lot of, of women working at the line with the details, with the labeling and, and everything. Mm -hmm. So what was the progress? So you're fourth generation and you've been CEO of the, the, the family business for 23 years. What, at, at, when did you really start to be aware and, and sort of push the envelope the, the background being for folks that don't know the tequila business for years has been very sort of patriarchal and, mm -hmm. and male dominated. So what was the evolution for you to get to where you are now? How did that all start? I started actually as a CEO. I, I worked at Tenergias when I just finished college for, for two years. And then I, I decided to, to be at home and raising my family. And in uh, 1997, my, my husband passed away, and I decided then to, well, to run in the company, to took over the company. And since then, I, I thought at that time that it was going to be temporary, but it's uh, 23 years now, and I'm still enjoying a lot. This is very rewarding uh, to, to lead San Matias. It's a wonderful company, a wonderful team. And I'm in love to them, so still here. Well, and you, you've done a lot of changes technologically as well. One of the offerings, which is one of my favorites, is the Tahona. You do a, a Tahona wheel. Blanco, how has your production changed? For people who don't know, Tahona is, would be a very, very old traditional way of pressing the juice out of the cooked piñas. Now, much more typical would be a roller mill with water spraying on. How, has, how have you brought technology along beside maintaining a very traditional process like a Tohona? At, at the distillery, we are practically the same. Our method, uh, production method, is very traditional. So we have a San Matias Tajona is the only brand that we have that is uh, milling in a Tajona. The rest of the portfolio is uh, with a roller mill, but we, we are cooking the agaves in, in stone ovens in the, like a very traditional way. So the technology that, that we have been improving is more in the bottling facility for the labeling and, and the bottling. But we are not very modern even. I, I prefer to offer jobs like putting in a balance. Uh, uh, our, our bottling facility and the distillery are located in a very small towns and we are practically the only source of job there. So sure. we prefer to offer more jobs in, instead of uh, having a, a high-tech uh, bottling facility. And the industry, the, you mentioned that the industry has been changing dramatically in these 23 years. Everything has been changing. Now tequila, it's a global industry. It wasn't that way back there in the 90s. And the sophistication of the education of the consumers in a, is in a different level now. And I think that uh, the evolution also is in our country in, in, in every industry, but in tequila industry as well. I, I have been very lucky in my life when I started uh, running the company all my colleagues were very, very nice and very supportive. So I, I have the best experience with being a woman in, in this industry. So you so how much of how much of the property? So just sort of talk, let's talk about. Do you own how much of your agave do you own? Depends on the year. Uh, we we are facing a shortage of agave. You you must know that. We are at the end of this shortage. So it depends on the year. Our goal is to have at the most 80% of our agaves. So there's years that we have been having 50%, 40%, 30%, 60%, so depending on the year. The agave, you know, that requires seven years, six, seven, eight years to grow. The average is seven years. And it, it could be affected with a very heavy winter with the fires, with diseases. So there is a lot of risk growing a plant for seven years in the ground. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it, it, it varies a lot. But uh, we, we, we wanted always to support also the local agave growers. 
So it's not our intention to own all the agave that, that we need. The only thing is that we, uh, we require that these agaves um, are in the highlands of Jalisco. It, it's uh, okay. because of the altitude, we like the profile of those agaves. From yeah, that richer, sweeter agave profile from those yeah. highland grown plants, yeah. Well, and it's, it's tough because of the age as well, because as you know, and I think as people become more educated, they realize that, you know, seven years should be standard, but that's actually old now for an agave plant versus what other much larger producers are, are rushing a little bit in terms of what they're harvesting. Mm -hmm. So how much, so it's how much more difficult has it been for you to maintain that standard and still get enough, still very, get enough agave. Yeah, very difficult, Brad. These past three years has been very challenging for the industry, but we are almost there, almost finishing yeah. this, this stage. And we are going to face the, the, the opposite situation with a lot of agave. So it's, it's better that we start selling more because there would be a lot of agave to produce with no limit. Well, that's your good, but your relationships, I would guess that you would try to maintain long-term relationships with your growers, you know, both because it helps them and helps the economy in the area, but also because it gives you more certainty as to what you're going to be able to get to produce with. So are you now trying to just sort of balance that, which I know a lot of people are trying to make sure that you have, you're talking to your farmers about what's happening in seven years, not just what's happening next year. Yes, it's so difficult to plan in the long term and also to, to explain to agave growers that it's, uh, but the, the agave growers that has been like a tradition in their families, they know, they know that it's like their savings. There's because of the high prices, a lot of new agave growers have uh, arrived to, the, to, to the, this industry. And that's fine. We are we are dealing with them too. They are learning, so they they let us to to take care of the agave fields sometimes, to 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 have it uh, to have them in the the best shape possible. So we participate with uh, with them too, with some agave growers. We have different uh, like structures. Sometimes we we own the land and we plant it. Other times we rent the, the property and we take care of the agaves and others we just supervise um, the, 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 during the year the, the fields, but they, the agave growers are taking care of them directly. Are there any standards that you maintain with your own, with your own agaves that you have to make sure are maintained and consistent against uh, your kind of independently grown agave plants that you're looking for? Yes, it, we have a team. It's a very experienced team. And the agave is, is very, I, I like to say that they are like children. Every agave grows a different rhythm. So we can have in a field agaves fully mature at six years old and others not. So it requires a lot of visual supervision. You need to walk through the fields and select the agaves that, that you are going to harvest. And mm -hmm. it's not like, okay, this uh, property is going to be harvested. Oh, no, that, that doesn't happen here. So we actually, we pick one by one all the agaves that we are going to use. So that's the best way to control quality as well. Everything starts from the agaves. So it's so important to have a, the fully mature agaves and uh, from, from the area that we needed. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, you're using natural, how much of your, you know, we were talking about the quiotes behind, how much of, how much are you able to use sort of the natural reproduction because you're having older agaves, you know, ver versus, versus doing nursery and doing plantings? No, we, we do plantings, Brett. We don't use, uh, we, we don't leave them to, to have uh, the quiotes because the result that we, that we may have, it's a different species and, and we, can, uh, we can hold that risk. So we okay. prefer to the, 
to the, the baby agaves, we, we plant them, but we select the baby as agaves as well. Okay. So there, there's different sizes and it normally refers to citrus, like, a, like how do you say, grapefruit size or orange size or lime size or even pineapple size. So we, we use between grapefruit and pineapple sizes to actually me Megan planted an agave like two years ago, Megan. <laughs> And her agave, her agave was the only one with babies at the first year after planting. So it's, it's a, it could be completely different. It's very funny and very, well, I, I don't know, it, it, every day is different at the fields. And uh, it, it actually a storm or a early spring as we had this year, we had a, our winter was very mild and very short. So that early spring uh, helped us to mature the garlic faster. So they are very sensitive to weather, to the weather conditions. So all the agaves for your tequila are of course Weber blue agave as is required by law, but you're also dabbling in the world of mezcal now, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So is that made at this at the family distillery there or is that made on contract with other growers and distillers? So we are doing it in Oaxaca. Let me show a bottle of Los Vecinos. I have it here. This is uh, Me Megan's baby. <laughs> and I'm so proud to collaborate with him. Our intention here is with the mezcal, it's a story that when I was in college, I was doing social work at Oaxaca. And I know Oaxaca is one of the poorest states in the country. So uh, uh, we have learned that through our work and offering like uh, uh, fair salaries and fair, uh, like, well, I don't know how to say prestaciones. Megan, do you happen to know the translation of that word? Like all the benefits. That right, are, benefits and wages. Like, uh, benefits, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we, we have learned that, that there, it's possible to help and support a community through a good work. So I was uh, having a conversation with Megan and say, would you be interested in doing something in Oaxaca? And we, we don't, it's not our intention to, to teach them anything. They, are, they have a beautiful product full with tradition and we want to honor that. The only thing is that in tequila, in the, this industry, we, we have been having time to grow and, and be prepared. And in Mezcal, the, the growth has been so fast that mm -hmm. they, are, they, they, are, they are struggling with, uh, with the, this evolution. It's, everything is so fast. So we want to share with them, as, uh, actually the, the name of, of our brand is Los Vecinos. Los Vecinos means neighbors. And Oaxaca is a neighbor of Jalisco, and Mezcal is a neighbor of Tequila, and Mexico is a neighbor of the U.S. So in Mexico, neighbors collaborate, neighbors support each other, and neighbors became part of your family as well. So this is a story behind this brand. We, we picked 10 families. Rocio, our master distiller, picked 10 families there. So we are working. This is a blend of the juice of 10 palenques. And uh, the, the profile is, is beautiful. This is uh, the Espadine uh, variety, but we have two more expressions in Ensemble and Tobala, and there's more to come. So we decided to be in Oaxaca because we wanted to support that community and because regarding tradition, well, Oaxaca is Oaxaca in, in the mezcal category. So it's, uh, it has been a lot of fun doing that. And uh, we have a lot of projects we just, uh, we went, Megan, and actually it was my last trip this year because of the, the COVID. We went to Oaxaca in February and we visited some foundations. We, we picked one. We are going to support girls with scholarships. Girls with, with, uh, from the small towns. Some of them uh, are learning Spanish. They, they, they speak in their dialects. And we want to support them with scholarships to complete a full education till college. So it's our intention to start working in the community and uh, like make a difference in, in the state little by little. 
No. And that, that seems to be a theme and is for people, Mezcal in terms of widespread popularity has really exploded in the, it's always been growing, but it's really exploded in the United States, which has meant that the amount of volume that's produced has been exploding. And it's important for people to know just what you said, you know, obviously you took what was a long tradition of caring about your employees, that there was a lot of exploitation that went on in Oaxaca as the beginning of, you know, the beginning of the Mezcal business started to bloom. So it's refreshing to know that there's some bigger organizations are coming in and making sure that that doesn't happen. Thank you. You know, Brad. that it, people are, the people are being treated fairly for their life's work. Yeah. And I think it's more, it's important for more Mexican companies to be extending into Mezcal as well, which is not necessarily the norm. So I think that's yeah. something that um, Carmen borrows nicely from Jalisco yeah. to Oaxaca. As long as CRM doesn't, uh, as long as CRM doesn't try to change too many rules and commercialize too many things, and yep. take away some of the take away some of the uniqueness and tradition around mezcal that's produced all over, not just in Oaxaca but mm -hmm. all over Mexico. Mm -hmm. yes. well, speaking of that, Carmen, you mentioned that that the uh, Los Vecinos is sourced from ten different palenques. Um, do they share a common? type of still that they're using or anything? Or is this truly just a pretty a broad blend? And how hard has that been to keep it consistent between those 10 different distillery sources? It is challenging to keep the consistency, but uh, Rocio has been able to do it. So the, the blend is not every batch, it's not the same percentage. So it depends on the profile that we want to, to, to keep it. Mm -hmm. so it's, uh, there are the same families, but sometimes we there is a blend of six families, or sometimes eight, sometimes ten. But the the ten of them are working in the three expressions that that we actually have that we have now. And the process the process is fairly consistent, and they've ultimately agreed to a profile, which helps us with the blend. So we have more flexibility. Okay. And Rocio manages the blending aspect of that across the families. Right. So there's a, there's a profile that is the Los Vecinos Espadín, the Ensemble, the Tobolab, um, and each family is using similar methods. Obviously, uh, most of them are farmers as well, so it's their agave. Mm -hmm. And then um, stone molinos for extraction, um, uh, wooden vats for fermentation, similar wood being used, and then copper pot stills, um, twice distilled. So the process is very similar, and they might be doing different processes for different spirits that they're uh, okay. distilling, but we okay. ultimately aligned on that. So, so they might be doing some clay distillation or more traditional, I'm, I'm guessing you probably don't get a lot of the Filipino stills as much there, more the clay and the copper? Mm -hmm. I, I believe so, Carmen. I yeah. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's that style. Mm -hmm. okay. But you know the difference is that at Oaxaca, at Mezcal, you don't add any yeast to the fermentation. So it's a natural and very slow fermentation. So depending on the season and depending on the region uh, down there in Oaxaca, it's the result that you are going to have. Even though the process is the same, the, the cooking of the caves is the same with the woods and you know, all the the process, the, the yeast plays a very important role in, in, the, in the product, in the final product. Sure, which people, yeah, which I, to me is fascinating because that is truly, it's even more of the place than just where the agave comes from. Yes. And where the agave comes from is important, but yeah, the, the, the traveling through Michoacan and to Ricea producers throughout, you know, in Southwest and, and, and outside of Guadalajara and Jalisco. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's amazing how people are using the same plants and using somewhat the same methods, but producing in some cases wildly different. Wildly different spirits. Yeah. Wildly different spirits, yeah. That's really cool. Well, bringing it back to tequila for a bit, because that is what we do want to taste today, I suppose. <laughs> you mentioned earlier that you have a very large aging room at the distillery at San Mateus. Um, how many different, uh, I, I guess, what's the breakdown on, of all the tequila you're producing, uh, what, about what percentage of it actually gets aged in wood 
versus being bottled as a Blanco? I may say that probably 80% of what we sell is aged in Reposados. In Mexico, um, we sell a lot of aged tequilas and Reposados. The U.S. is we are exporting Blancos. So mm -hmm. the, in, from our brands in Mexico, we are just uh, like the favorites and the consumers for aged in tequila, extra aged mm -hmm. and Reposados. So we have in the in our aging rooms thirteen thousand barrels. Wow! And we have wow. white and American oak and French oak, and we have new and used barrels. So we we, we uh, Rocio likes to play with with the wood a lot, in order to have the different profiles. And our portfolio is is wide. We, seven brands is, is not easy. And then uh, we add Corazon and, and Los Vecinos because our intention is to offer to, to the consumer like something to match with, with the, the time of the day that you are sitting or the, the event that you are having. If you're having a party with friends, if it's summer, if it's winter, if it's something mm -hmm. you have a special occasion, we have always something for that moment. So it's uh, our dream to be with, with you and you in your life and the different things. And we have always everything for you. So always something for you. So it was interesting. One of our one of our uh, one of our watchers actually asked a question about tequila based cocktails with local cuisine, and then if you had recommendations for what you would eat with pozole, carne carne and sujugo, yugo, or birria. Nigeria. I think for that, uh, I, I would prefer uh, a Blanco. A Blanco. Okay. But there, there is a very, a favorite cocktail, very basic cocktail, and, and a Paloma in Mexico. Mm. And we need a Paloma match with everything as well. So a Paloma, you, you can do it with a Repo. We use a lot for, for cocktails here, PV Repo, Pueblo Viejo Reposado. And uh, that's match very good with a Birria. With a, with a pozole as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, pozole is something, depending on how you make your pozole, but to something to take the heat off. It's something that about Something that, do you make, do you make your pozole spicy? I, I made my pozole of mushrooms because I am vegan. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> but with my pozole, a paloma match very well. Yeah. yeah. So let's taste this Corazon Blanco. Yeah. Um, we have another expression of Corazon and it's extra aged. It's a beautiful product too. We have here the... Um, I would like to invite Megan to, to taste Corazon <laughs> Blanco. This is where... We like to say that, that Corazon is like a contemporary expression of tequila. We have found that it's, uh, it's very well received, has been um, it's a lot of awards in this brand. And uh, please, Megan, do the honor to, to taste. <laughs> well, as you're going through just reference, what kind of stills are, what kind of stills do you run at, at, at Corazon or at Casa San Mateos. Mm -hmm. What kind of, what I'm sorry? What Just, type of, what type of stills, stills. are you running on? We, we use a stainless steel. Okay. Um, yes. And the, the Blanco, well, the Corazon recipe is slightly different. As Carmen mentioned, it's something we call a bit more contemporary versus some of her more traditional uh, brands. So Corazon, like a, uh, a Pueblo Viejo, a similar, similarly priced brand of Carmen's, which is very authentic and very straightforward. Um, while Corazon is a bit, is a bit more floral notes up front, has a, a it's quite smooth on the front. Um, comparative, you're not really getting knocked over with the the raw agave up front. It's a bit more approachable, um, which alludes to the contemporary comment. It is also oxygenated. Um, after the distillation, which is ultimately just opening up that tequila and bringing out some of those fruit and floral notes. Mm -hmm. So hopefully if, if folks are able to be tasting, you, you get a little bit of that off the nose. And as you 
as you take a couple sips, a lot of bright fruit, a lot, definitely agave, but uh, kind of opened up. It's almost like decanting a wine with the oxygen. Yeah, it's like, it's like that soft honeyed agave and it's got a nice citrus fruit character to it. It's, it's very fruity and easy, very approachable. Almost like- Well, that would get rid of, that would get rid of a lot of volatiles if you did that, right? So any, if you had any, any, any volatile alcohols and any heavier alcohols, that aeration, yes. I mean, it, it's, you could do the same thing with a shorter cut as well, probably, because they're, your steel stills, are they pot style or are they more column style? No, they're, they're pot style. Pot style. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, there's a lot of uh, pineapple here too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a not. It's, it's just smooth. It's, it's delicious. It's very easy to drink this, this tequila. And the cuts are different. In distillation, this is like the secret of this, uh, of this brand. Like the, the heart is really the heart of the distillation, the second distillation. So this is a narrower cut overall that you're taking on Corazon. Yeah. Yes. Thus the name Corazon. Mm -hmm. And you would not change any of that production for what you're putting in the barrel. In other words, you're, you're making a particular style and that's the Blanco, but that's also what gets put into wood to be Reposado. They're you're not going to take a different one. cut for the... Okay. It's a family here. It's a family. So we have the Blanco, Reposado, Añejo, and extra Añejo as well. I have a bottle here. This is an extra aged. Mm -hmm. Which is just, it's funny when the business, when, when tequila first started selling, especially super premium first started selling in the United States, you know, 15 or 20 years ago, I think that the number one seller that we would have seen at that time would have been Añejo. And yeah. it's one of the few categories where as things have grown, things have grown by going backwards and aging, mm -hmm. you know, so instead of we've gone backwards and we're now by a long shot in the United States, the number one seller is Blanco, number mm -hmm. two Reposado, number three Añejo, which is amazing given how popular other aged products are in the United States, mm -hmm. especially the explosion of, of, of American whiskey, you know, American whiskey, rye, bourbon, mm -hmm. that tequila has kind of gone the other direction. Yes, it's, it's funny, but it is, yeah. It's certainly a lot larger, right? growing so much that it almost, it asked the question of it, but it was some folks who needed kind of the entry into it, which obviously brands like Patron in the US, you know, grew off of the, the Blanco and, and that kind of introduced a lot of folks to more premium tequila. But um, Carmen talked about it earlier about the having quite full aging warehouses and she's been very uh, welcoming for us to bring a bunch more barrels down. So we've kind of bridged this concept of folks who understand age, who are getting excited about bourbon, and we're bringing a bunch of barrels down. Uh, Brett, as you know, from Buffalo Trace Distillery in Kentucky, which is our partnership. Um, so Carmen's been kind enough to make some room, let us let us crash there with some uh, <laughs> with well, a fair amount of bourbon barrels, actually. So that has been a direct response to, hey, we want to get more folks that have fallen in love with Blanco tequila to fall in love with these aged expressions as aficionados have been you know, doing for years, to your point. Um, and they certainly are, are on the bourbon train. So um, it's a little bit of that bridging some lots of things we love. <laughs> well, that, that was a huge for us. We did, you know, we started this discussion three or four years about, about what we referred to as a boomerang project where mm -hmm. we, we have a pretty extensive barrel program that we do with Buffalo Trace and a number of the different brands that come out of Buffalo Trace. And mm -hmm. we were just lucky enough to do our first launch of a uh, Corazon Reposado and a Corazon Añejo that were both in uh, Buffalo Trace brands, one from, Blanton's one from a, an old Weller barrel, mm -hmm. which disappeared like that. We like to think because they were they were incredible, incredible tequilas. Mm -hmm. So how much of that is the how 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 hard is that to track, Carmen? How hard is it to to sort of keep all of that straight and in one to keep track of that, follow that through? 
because one of the questions we had from one of the listeners is also how do you make the choice about what is going to be pulled and bottled as reposado and what you want to leave to go beyond the year to become añejo or in the case of Ray Sol, even further to become extra añejo how do you make that decision it depends on the profile that, that we want to achieve uh, for example this uh, reposado corazón reposado it could be aged for 16 or 18 months. So it depends uh, uh, of the use of the barrel that we have. In for tequila, you are able to use use barrels, and uh, you can use it several times. But it, it it it's not the same. Of course, if you have a new barrel, it's going to be darker immediately, but the the, the profile is going to be like different. And use barrel in a barrel have that has been used for, for a, a bourbon, an American whiskey, is different. So that's what I, I mentioned that Rocio, our master distiller, likes to play with the wood. And now she has a lot of toys, <laughs> a lot of projects. And Rocio is the one that really chooses the, the, the blend of barrels that we are going to use for each batch, like, uh, like this, for example. So, so you, have, uh, you have some reposados that age up to 18 months? Uh, it, yeah. Reposados, it's more like, uh, it depends of, of what you want. For example, the, the average reposado that we have is nine months, mm -hmm. but it depends of the, of the results that you want. So, yeah. it, uh, it, you know, in, in, in tequila, the CRT is very strict and we appreciate mm -hmm. that. So a blend, you, you are able to blend uh, a rep of three months, a rep of 11 months mm -hmm. with a añejo of 18 months and it's a rebel mm -hmm. where it's a uh, it's and, and rocio used a lot of this blend to keep the profile that we want so some repos has blends of, of uh, añejos barrels like more than than 12 months more than i think months. that's really refreshing to see that you're you know you're you're working toward an overall quality with the reposado, even though it's kind of that middle ground with aging, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of distilleries might just take anything that's 18 months and never put it in anything less than 12, just so they can put it on the shelf and charge more money for it. Um, I think that's really cool that you that you're looking for that oakier profile, even in a reposado. Yes, we, we care a lot of that. And even our añejos, so sometimes there's a blend with some extra añejos as well. So, but the CRT, uh, like, make us, I have in the less, the, le the minimum age of the blending. Mm -hmm. So, if you are blending an, an extra age with an age, the result will be an age tequila, not yeah. an age. Mm -hmm. well, it doesn't matter if you are blending 80% of extra age and 20% of age, the result is going to be an still age. Still aged. Yeah, similar to how it would be with scotch whiskey or something like that. Mm -hmm. Well, and, I, and it also points out the difficulty how how hard your job is as a producer to plan what you're going to be bottling six months nine months 12 months 18 because you can't take tequila off the still fill a bunch of barrels and say that's reposado yeah because yeah. you don't know what's going to happen with it until it's been in the barrel for a while i think yeah. people don't always understand that you can't just pinpoint and plan production that way Mm -hmm. that you have to wait until the tequila, you have to watch the tequila as it grows up. Mm -hmm. And really that compliment is for Rocio, our master distiller. I, I rely totally on her and I, I wish uh, she could be uh, here with, with us today, but Rocio is learning uh, English, so it's, it's on her way, but she's really <laughs> wonderful. She's wonderful. So she takes care of, of every, and, and she knows every barrel. 13,000. And I said, Rosie, are you sure? Yes, this barrel and all the characteristics. And, and she has like the, the following for each one of them. So she knew when, she knows when, when we are going to bottle something, she knows the numbers of barrels that, that she needs for the profile. Of course, after tastings, and you know, we have a panel at the bottling facility, we have a second panel at the uh, offices. The offices are in Guadalajara. So Rossi is very professional. It's not just like her opinion. He also has these uh, these panels with uh, 
the, the members of the team that, that work for San Matias, they have been trained and they offer like volunteer to, to be part of the family. It's a hard work, but <laughs> <laughs> they enjoy it. Yeah. So this is the reposado, and if you, do you want to taste it, it's a beautiful yeah. color. Well, it's a beautiful tequila. It's a beautiful tequila. And I say that the, the average here, we try to be like eight months. Like I was saying, sometimes we need to blend and age tequila here because everything is natural, the color and the, the notes are natural. And it's to me it's so clean and spicy and has a, like a light wood. Some dry food to meat. Yeah, you don't. It's amazing. You don't really lose. You don't lose the DNA. You don't lose the distillate, despite the fact that it's been aged. Mm -hmm. I mean, as you long still, as if you know, aged. if you know the blanco, if you know what the blanco tastes like, you can kind of know that this is corazon with that tropical fruit and all that. It's still there, even though wood has been added to it. So mm -hmm. that's the idea, Brit. The idea, the idea, Brit. The idea is to have a family here. So you can, you can have the, the, the Blanco and after almost a year you have this one and year and a half you have the Añejo and three years later you have the extra Añejo. Yeah. But it's still the family. So with all the changes you've gone and this is becoming increasingly more important or at least more aware for people, what environmental steps have you taken in your production? to just try to preserve the community and preserve your environment? The most important thing that we have done is to, to build the biodigester at the distillery. The biodigester helps us to, to convert like the waste after the second distillation of tequila. That waste, the name uh, in Spanish is dinasa. It has a lot of organic material on it. So with the biodigester, we are able to to keep the gas from the fermentation of that uh, organic material and produce biogas. And with the biogas, we are able to feed the boilers for the, 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 the steam, to produce the steam for, the, for cooking the gas. And with the rest, uh, uh, with the waste of the biodigester, we are doing compost to, we are using that for our own projects. Mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, it's growing. And our concern as the, the tiny town that we are located, the name is Ojo de Agua, and we have a spring waters there. So we, we need to be very conscious that not putting the component under the, the property or the town, to, so no, uh, any alteration to the, the, the quality of water that we have there. This is one of my opportunities to be Carmen's hype woman um, <laughs> because she's very humble and uh, this is when I get to shout, shout her praises. So Carmen's been recognized for having one of the smallest carbon footprints in the tequila industry. And as really a craft distillery, she's made a, an enormous investment in that biodigester. It's one of only four in the industry. Um, so it's, wow. again, I think and that's why that's why we brought it up because we're aware and that and again because of the uniqueness and and tequila is such a function of the environment i mean i think that that's why it's important it's not just for a business decision it may you know you can't you, you have to maintain your area you have to keep your own you know your own area clean and that's good so does that is there what standards have to be met to be considered organic in Mexico. What do you, is that part of maintaining some level of organic production? It's very difficult, Brett, because you need to have like uh, 10 kilometers around being organic. Mm. And it's okay. very difficult to control it. You don't know what your neighbors are doing in their right. field. So to our, our fields are not organic. We don't have the certification where we are free of pesticides. We use just natural, you know, garlic and ginger and pepper and those uh, things. One of my sons is, uh, is in charge of the agave fields and, and he's passionate about the, the, the natural 
antibiotics that we have in nature to use it for for the our agave. But we sure. it's very difficult to certify as an, as an organic. So, but you but you can be you're responsible for your practices, right? And that's the most important thing is that you're responsible for your practices. Yeah, I, I think that's the, the sense for us, the sense of, of the, the, the willing to grow, it just, like if it's possible to grow in, in every way, like being responsible with your community, be of course responsible with your team and with environment, just that. And of course, that at the end, we want to offer the best quality tequilas to offer our, our clients, our consumers. Mm -hmm. but, but without a, a piece of that, it's not enough for us. So we are, we have invested, well, a lot for that, but, but we are proud to, to help the environment as well. And then how, how has production been? Have you run into any, any pro problems or holdups with production just because of distancing, it, 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 because of COVID? Has that what what kind of hurdles has that put up in front of you? No, we we haven't had uh, like difficulties for that. We had at the beginning of, of the, the this uh, COVID, the the COVID arrived in Mexico in like uh, March, and we. Well, that was right after Brett was there. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I was there in January. <laughs> little little after that. And our, our governor support us uh, as an industry to, to have it like considered essential. So thanks for that, we, we, are, we will be able to, we were able to work and continue working. And there is no, uh, no COVID at, at the towns where we have our facilities, mm -hmm. so zero cases. We, we haven't had any, any situation of course, like people over 65 or with uh, vulnerability, uh, they are staying at home. And for example, at the bottling facility, there were like 17 people, uh, part of our team that we need to hire more people for, for all the, the, the production that we need. Mm -hmm. But besides that, they're safe at home and, and we, are, we are able to work safely as well. And so all of your, for, for Casa San Matias, for Pueblo Viejo, for Corazon, are, that's everything is being done in your town. None of that goes to Guadalajara? Or does some of that production go to Guadalajara? Yeah, some of them come to Guadalajara because we have a strong presence, strong presence here in the domestic market in Jalisco, the state where Guadalajara is the capital. We sell a lot of product here. But we have just a warehouse here and the offices. And all okay. the, the production and the, war, the main warehouse is there at, at the bottom. Okay. Facility. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I think Brett, well, your uh, Carmen's husband is also in the tequila industry. Um, and his, I think you, his distillery is what um, is probably coming to mind on some of the other production um, closer to Guadalajara. Correct, Carmen? Yes, Rodolfo's distillery is in Guadalajara. Okay. It's the only one. I, I haven't heard of another distillery. It's easier to have it like in, in the place where you have mainly your agaves. Mm -hmm. It's easier. Mm -hmm. Well, so, and like you said, it's, 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 it's the opposite of what people would think. The business is really driven by the people who are doing all the jobs, which is why it's easy and pretty efficient to keep everything you know, just to keep everything in the, in the place where everything is done. Yeah. So Carmen, I have, t I have two questions for you. Um, first of all, if you're going to, if you are personally relaxing with and drinking one tequila that is produced at, at your distillery, which one would it be? If I'm going to relax, probably I would, I would um, pick this one. It's uh, an extra age. Three years. I love this brand. What kind of? And uh, that was. What kind of wood is that aged in? Yeah. It's a blend of, of wood, a French and an American oak. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah. Years aged tequila. It's, it's very tasty. Very. Mm -hmm. 
and that I think in the United States, they, at least knowing for the years that it, going back to the Henry Price days with that, that mm -hmm. is that that's the brand that for me really for a long time defined Casa San Mateus mm -hmm. was the was the was the special añejo. And and my other question. Um, you obviously produced the outstanding Expressiones line from Corazon with those wonderful barrels that you're getting from the Buffalo Trace Distillery. Is there anything new and upcoming on that front or can we expect to see more of those in the future? Yes, there is a lot of projects and I think I'm not able to, to talk about them yet. But just, just pretend Megan's not here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think we have a couple of barrels down there. We should have a couple of barrels down there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say, there's. I, I think it's fair to put out some teasers. I, we're mm -hmm. about to announce the 2020 release um, that will be available come late September. Um, so we tend to, uh, Rocio uh, tinkers and, and, and kind of experiments with a lot of different barrels. So this year, um, that release will have a stag añejo, a... Um, Thomas Handy Sazerac Añejo and a uh, W. L. Weller, which we've never done before. So those are all again That's cool. um, barrels coming from Buffalo Trace Distillery. But Carmen has uh, allowed Rocio and and the team to also experiment with some wine casks. So there's a possibility that this time next year we'll be talking about some really different, uh, possibly extra aged expressione. So very we have cool fun with that and and. Carmen and Rocio and the team's uh, willingness to experiment fits well with some of the ideas that we that we come up with. <laughs> and the expression oh, cool. that, that you were showing, and Megan, could you show the bottom again? Oh yes, and this one in particular. This one, uh, I know you guys have seen. This is the Sazerac. Mm -hmm. Yes. From last year, which has been very well received. Yeah. Um, it's a beautiful line. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Those dis those disappear off of our shelves as quickly as we can put them on the shelf. So, yeah, well, they're outstanding products. So, Carmen, it was a real pleasure talking to you about everything going on at your distillery today. It's uh, it's always great to hear about you know sustainability and both and you know fairness and environmental practices, employment practices, all that. Uh, you make just incredibly excellent tequila that's favorably priced too, which I appreciate is a legendary cheap cake. So uh, really appreciate you talking to us today about all these different agave spirits and hopefully we can have you on again sometime. And hopefully we get to go down to Mexico at some point. Yeah, please. That's right. Oh, you're <laughs> welcome. Thank you so much for your time and your interest. It's a privilege to, to have you share this time with you. Thank you so much. Thank right, you. Carmen, and thanks thank everybody you. for joining us. We'll be back. Uh, next Friday, I think we have some uh, whiskey blenders from Brown Foreman on. So Megan and Carmen, again, thank you very much. Cheers, everyone. Enjoy your weekend. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Cheers. Take Bye. care. Bye. Bye.